Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, um, th thanks to Claire for, for uh, help, helpfully defining the Goldilocks rate in, in the introduction, which I do think is a very natural uh, benchmark. But uh, the title of, of the panel is, is uh, Drivers of Equilibrium Interest Rates. So uh, it's multiple, maybe. So is it a single interest rate? Uh, does it vary across countries? Uh, do we think about the equilibrium policy rate? Or do we think about the equilibrium margin product of capital, for example? Or, or do we think about the equilibrium yield curve? So already, uh, let's see how much progress we make in, in the next 90 minutes. It's also, I think, uh, maybe the panel uh, will we'll get to some of these issues. It is, uh, one version of this is, uh, let's just take an, an economic perspective. In other words, a real economy perspective. So in a world without any finance or money, you can think about the equilibrium of world savings and investment. However, then you can say, well, still staying in a real uh, setup, add a financial system. Add a financial system that works, but sometimes that doesn't. And when it doesn't work, when there's a, a broken financial system and intermediation is non-trivial, does that change the uh, interest rate that's needed to deliver the, the Goldilocks equilibrium? And then, of course, on top of that, you can move from a world where you also add money. And if you add money, it raises the interesting question about uh, nominal factors versus real factors, and whether, in a most intriguing way, uh, you can uh, break the separation between mon the uh, short-run effects of monetary policy and the long-run equilibrium. Uh, so no doubt we'll have uh, delivered uh, con sharp conclusions at the end of this, where all of these are, are, are settled uh, topics. Uh, and uh, this, this should be a very productive uh, 90 minutes. So with that, I, I won't, you've seen the bios. Uh, we have very, uh, a great set of speakers, and I, I hope blended across the different the worlds we live in between academia, policy organizations, and central banks. And with that, uh, the, the lineup is, is alphabetical, so Claudio, over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you for the very kind invitation. Um, uh, I will, however, be probably the, the proverbial party pooper, in the sense that I'm sure that you have invited me for a reason, and the reason is that I tend to be rather skeptical about our star, and I will not disappoint you. Uh, <laughs> So what, what is the question that the panel has been asked? Is uh, we, where will real rates, real interest rates go? And in order to answer that question, we're invited to think in terms of where will R star go? Well, my answer, if you like, as that famous joke goes, is that, well, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. I would not pose the question that way. That's effectively what I will be trying to argue. Because thinking about where real interest rates will go based on R star is probably not particularly helpful. And for much the same reasons as R star, I think, is not a particularly helpful compass for, for monetary policy. So I'll try to explain that in the time available. By the way, the usual disclosure does apply. I mean, the, the views that I'll be expressing are my own and not necessarily those of the BIS. Um, I think some distance helps in this context. It will allow me to be a bit more provocative. For, for the views of the BIS, there is a whole box in the annual economic report that actually discusses our star. Of course, they're not that different, but there are some differences. So let me start. What's the definition of our star? And I think we can converge at least on one. There are many. But that our star is that short-term real interest rates rate that would prevail when output is at potential, inflation stable over a target, once disturbances in the economy have died out. So in some kind of steady state. Now think of our star, and I will come back to this, as the real interest rate that would prevail when the economy is in a quote unquote good place. So fundamentally, as we know, our star is an unobservable model-based concept that refers to a hypothetical state of the world. Now, R star can be a useful guide as to where real interest rates will go, actual real interest rates will go, to the extent that two conditions hold. The first is that over time, the economy is close to steady state, on average, so that the real rates actually reflect R star. And the second is that there is a reliable link between R star and its determinants, 
so that one can form a view about uh, how our star will evolve in, in the future. Now, the problem is that on closer examination, on closer examination, empirical evidence does not really support either proposition very much. And the reason is that the evidence that invoked in favor of our star invariably simply assumes that one or both of those propositions hold. That is, it doesn't really provide any independent evidence for them. And this is true regardless of the approach, whether you're thinking in terms of calibration, narrative, or filtering. And we can sort of discuss that later. But the key point is that, in fact, if one allows the data to speak and test directly, directly the link between the so-called, the candidate determinants of uh, R star and market interest rates over, over long periods, well, the evidence suggests that this link is very loose. Now, let me be more precise about this. Um, the, in, in BIS work that we did some time ago, and actually that has been uh, and there is growing evidence uh, in, uh, that is going that way, in including recently a paper by Rogoff. What we do is that we consider a whole set of usual suspects, demographics, growth, price of capital, income distribution, government debt, and variance, variance of real interest rates over long periods and possible proxies for our star, looking at 19 countries. And we find that there is a reasonable, indeed, well, quite a reasonable link over the standard period. That's since the mid-1980s onwards, when real interest rates were declining. Remember, the whole period started with a Volcker shock. But the link actually effectively disappears if you go further back in time and you look at a longer period, going back to the 1890s, and you break the period up in various subphases as well. Now, given this, it's not surprising to see such a heated debate about where our star is and where it's going, given that the factors that explain our star tend to be very slow moving, and they presumably have changed quite, quite little, why should the current estimates of our star that are being produced be considerably higher than they were before? And since the evolution of the various candidates could pull in opposite directions, then the effects are so hard to parcel out. I, mean, it's, I find this it's going to be very difficult to tell where interest rates are going to go and where our star is going to go. And I find this a rather sterile debate. You know, in, in Italian, we have an expression which is, it's a little bit like deba debating about the gender of angels. And you tell me which gender they have. Now, this brings me to what is probably the more controversial, if this hasn't been controversial, part of my presentation, which is about the link between uh, real interest rates and, and monetary policy. Now, in contrast to the empirical evidence that I just mentioned concerning the usual suspects, I think there is growing evidence, growing evidence that points to a link between monetary policy and real interest rates over long periods. It's not, this is not very short cycles, over long periods that are, are even abstract from the, from the cycles. Now, for one, for example, in, in the same uh, exercise that we did in the past, we also checked for the link between real interest rates and monetary policy regimes. And of course, in order to do that, you have to go way back in history and look across regimes. And we go back to the classical gold standard, and we find that the level and even the change of real interest rates over long horizons is systematically linked to the monetary policy regimes, even, even controlling for the usual suspects. And in addition, I think uh, we have become familiar with, with recent work that has found a strong link between monetary policy annou announcements and the behavioral of long-term real interest rates over long periods since the 1980s, suggesting that a lot of it is driven by, can be driven by monetary policy. Now, what does all this mean? Um, I think that maybe a promising, more promising place to start when assessing the future evolution of uh, real interest rates is the reaction function of the central bank. And now let me sort of dig a little bit into this and unpack this statement. Now, central banks, we know, sets, this, sets the short-term nominal interest rate, and given that prices tend to be predetermined, sets the real interest rate at any given point in time. And that also means, logically, at all points in time. And this is basically what the Taylor rule tells us. In addition, the central bank provides key guidance about where future interest rates will go and therefore influences the whole yield curve, and we had a debate yesterday on this. Now, in real, in real life, and in most models, 
It is, in fact, the central bank's role, it is the central bank's role to take the real interest rate to R star. It doesn't just happen spontaneously. So that to the extent that R star has information about the future evolution of real interest rates, it is through the reaction function of the central bank. Now, to underscore this point, when one says that central banks cannot, monetary policy cannot set the real interest rate in the long run, the only, the only thing that one can logically say, given what I said before, is that unless the central bank sets the real interest rates at R star, which is seen as independent of policy, something wrong will happen, and it will force the central bank to adjust. Now, in the models, typically what that, in the models that we have, what happens is that inflation either goes, shoots up or shoots down, and therefore the central bank has to do something about it. Now, I see two problems with these models, that with the end result, I think that they overestimate the extent to which R star imposes a constraint on monetary policy. The first one is that in practice, the link between the short-term real interest rate and output at potential and stable inflation is quite imprecise. So that is, there is a kind of range of interest rates that can roughly be consistent with, that, with those outcomes. So it's more like a thick correspondence as opposed to a precise function. Too many factors simply can come in between, even over extended periods. And this may indeed be one reason why estimates of R star that rely on these relationships have such large confidence bands. So in a way, it is not that um, we are measuring an, uh, a, a precise relationship imprecisely, but that the relationship itself is quite imprecise. So that it's not surprising that at any given point in time, we have such big debates about whether interest rates are above, below, or, uh, or at our star. Now, the second problem, and this is more subtle, is that the behavior of inflation may not be a sufficient statistic to take the central bank to a good place. That is, not a sufficient statistic for a safe journey. And in turn, this will have an impact on real interest rates over very long periods. Now, let me give you a couple of examples of uh, what I have in mind, which I discussed at length in previous work. The first one is what happened before the great financial crisis. When I would argue that the conjunction of secular disinflationary pressures, linked in particular to globalization and liberalized financial markets, meant that focusing exclusively on low and stable inflation led central banks inadvertently to accommodate the buildup of financial imbalances and then led to the great financial crisis which in turn was a major reason for the low for long that we saw afterwards. So let me stress, I'm not saying that monetary policy was the main factor and indeed the only factor. By any means, many other factors were more important. But I do think that monetary policy did contribute to that outcome. Second case, what happened following the great financial crisis? When even once the economies recovered, the same disinflationary forces and the fact that inflation was evolving in a low inflation regime in which it is less responsive to changes in monetary policy meant that as central banks were so hard trying to push inflation up to target uh, and they were not finding it easy, they ended up losing as opposed to gaining room for policy maneuver. So the idea there is inflation is not particularly responsive. You th the only way that you think you can gain room for maneuver that is raise nominal interest rates persistently is by raising inflation. But if in the process you actually do not succeed in raising inflation, you will be reducing interest rates. So you're effectively trading off a, a reduction in interest rate now, a, lose in, uh, a loss in um, a room for policy maneuver now in the expectation that you will gain in, in, in the future. Now, and to conclude, does this mean that monetary policy influences R star? Well, I think this depends very much on, it's a question of definition, it's a question of interpretation. But what I do think it means is that for all intents and purposes, the impact of monetary policy on real interest rates can be very long lasting and can be hardly distinguishable from an impact on R star, given the way that we measure it.
And it means that focusing on the central bank's reaction function as a starting point may be a better way of trying to work out where real interest rates will be going into the future. So to conclude, uh, when trying to work out where real interest rates might go in the future, uh, I would not try to read it from the stars. I would uh, probably first look at who actually sets the real interest rates at all points in time and what that, that institution responds to. Because at the end of the day, I think that our star, very much like beauty, uh, I think it's in, in the eyes of the beholder. So okay. thank you. Th 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 thank you, Claudio. And uh, next up is Federica. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much uh, for having me here. The usual disclaimer applied, I mean, because there is one person from the central bank that will help us to, to write this project. So why we are here today? We are here to discuss about our star, right? What is our star? Is the interest rate that ensures that the output is as its target and also inflation is as its target. Now, one of the main determinants of little r star is capital r star. That is the long run little r star but also the interest rate that equilibrates uh, the asset market in the long run. Why well, we are here to give you this, provide you this framework to understand our star, because we want to inform the policymaker so that uh, they can play or they can do their policy informed by our variable, our like number on our star. All this reasoning is based on what? On the standard dichotomy. So we think that in the long run, our star is determined by the real variable, by the real sector. Right? And that the monetary policy cannot do anything to select our star or to define our star. But what we're going to do in the next minutes is actually to challenge this view. And I think there wouldn't be a better introduction than the one of Claudio. So let's start with the basic. What is our star, right? Just to understand what is going on. So our star is the equilibrium, capital R star, is the equilibrium between, between demand and supply of asset. Demand of asset is positive slope, right? And this is made by the household. So the higher is the interest rate, the more asset you want to demand. And supplies of asset is negative slope. And is mainly made by corporate sector and by the government. So the higher is the interest rate, the less asset this uh, agent want to issue. Now the equilibrium between these two lines, between this line, yes, is actually our star, right? When they intersect. Now in the last 20 years, we do observe that our star has been very low for different reasons. Some people say this demographic, so a shift in the demand curve. Some other people argue that it's low productivity growth, so a shift in the supply curve. We should agree that in this framework, if we want to boost or increase our star, one possibility is to shift upward the supply curve, so to move from point A to point B. And one possibility is to increase the debt of the corporate sector, right? If the corporate sector issue more debt, this is going to shift the supply, and we're going to have a higher R star. Now, if we look at the data, we found that this is true before 2007. So here, like, is debt issuance of big firm, and we regressed this on R star, and we took the measure from Marco Del Negro and Coder, and we found that before 2007, when firm issue more debt, R star was actually increasing. Now, when we look after 2007, we found exactly the opposite. Whenever the corporate sector was issued more debt, our star was actually decreasing. And this is consistent with all the measure of our star. We took also the one of John and Coder. So this is very puzzling, first of all, because we have different effect, but also because in the standard model, we cannot think that when the firm issue more debt, actually our star is decreasing. So how can we rationalize this puzzle? What we did with quite a lot of coder, we wrote a paper oh, that is forthcoming now, hopefully, that is monopsony in Combrisk and R star multiplicity. So what is our framework? What, what is our novelty in the, in, the, in the standard framework? Let's assume the firm can issue more debt. We have the standard framework that is, OK, they issue more debt. There is greater supply of asset, right? Better insurance for the household. And this means that our star is increasing. Then we have a second mechanism. When firm issue more debt, they can grow larger, they can become bigger, and they can use more the monopsonistic powers vis-a-vis -vis to the worker. This means that workers are going to face lower wage in some state of the world. And this means that workers are going to actually have an increase in their income risk, 
And so in certain states of the world, you can observe that depth is increasing and our star is actually decreasing through this second mechanism. Let's explain this in a standard graph. We are economists. We like supply and demand. So this is demand of asset. Uh, actually, let me say something. We are going to use now depth instead of asset because in the model, all the only asset is the depth. But if we add to the instrument, things are going to carry through. Okay? So we start from point A, where there is a like certain equilibrium, where R star is, R is equal to R star. And now in a standard model, if Fermi issue more depth, what is going to happen is that you're going to move from point A to point B. So R star is going to increase. In our model, what happened is that now firms grow larger. They can decrease the wage of the worker using their monopsonistic power. And this means that these workers are going to face lower wage in the state of the world. So they're going to demand for more asset. So we're not going to move from point A to point B, but from point A to point C. Let's do this a second time, right? We're in point C, some firm issue more depth. You're going to move from point C to point E in a standard model. In our model, this is like trigger the second mechanism of monopsony. And what is going to happen is that the firm can grow larger and decrease uh, uh, the wage of certain worker in certain state of the world. The income risk is going to increase and they're going to demand for more asset. So now we can envelope all these equilibrium point. And what is going to happen is that the demand for asset is going to change. And let's zoom on the demand and explain a bit more. So what is going to happen is that the demand for asset in certain areas is positive slope if the insurance motive is going to prevail. And in some other area, I said this negative slope if the income risk is going to prevail. Now, what is important? Because now what we do, we, take, we plot again the supply and voila, we don't have any more one equilibrium point, but we can have two stable equilibrium point. And this means that what we're going to have, we're going to have state of the world in which we are in point A and state of the world in which we are in point B. We think that like point A is a point in which the interest rate is relatively high and there is like low monopsonistic power from the firm and low consumption risk. And this is very much maybe what happened pre-2007 when we observed that when the firm were issued more debt, the interest rate was increasing. And then there is a second point that is point B where the interest rate is low, there's going to be more monopsonistic power from the firm. The firm are going to issue more debt, but they're also going to increase consumption risk. Now, the problem is that how we're going to go from equilibrium, from one equilibrium to the other, right? So in the steady state, in the long run, they both coexist. You may think that cyclical policy can select one of the equilibrium. Also that uh, since we are in Sintra, we decide also to speak about monetary policy that can actually select one of the two equilibria. So is it possible that monetary policy can select an equilibrium in the long run? Now, in our framework, the answer is yes. So what we look is like look at asset purchase program. And in this case, what is going to happen in the, in the model, that even if the output is buying zero of this asset, then the central bank is directly or indirectly buying the asset on behalf of the household. And this is going to trigger the income risk channel. So the firms are going to grow larger maybe, and then they're going to squeeze the surplus of the worker in certain state of the work. So what is going to happen here, if we play this policy, the equilibrium A, where the interest rate is high and there is low consumption risk, is going to disappear, and the central bank is, doing, is going to select the equilibrium at point C. And in some sense, this is like, in our framework, what is going to happen is asset purchase may select the equilibrium with high consumption risk and lower star. And this is also in line with a uh, recent uh, um, uh, like statement from Isabel Schnabel that say that it could be that this uh, uh, asset purchase may have a long run effect that we didn't think about, right? So let me conclude. So we may think that we start by saying that what, what was our job you know, in this panel is that we're going to give you a number, we're going to give forecast so that you can play your policy or you can choose your policy optimally. However, if the framework that I'm describing is the right one, it's going to be very difficult because our star will depend on the policy and the policy will depend on our star. And this is like due to the fact that our framework featured this multiple city state. Let me say that we're not the first one Stephanie has a wonderful paper with multiple city state and also breaks the classical economy. And Claudio, I mean, among the others, among also Luca, there are some people that were saying long time that maybe the classical economy is not there anymore. 
Now, this means that cyclical shock, but also policy, can select the long-run equilibrium. And in some sense, this also means that policymakers have an extra and great power that it can play. They can affect not only the short run, but also the long-run equilibrium. However, this means that we need to have more research on this issue, and we need to understand deeply if this is the case, especially because, as a very wise and old man said, with great power come great responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Stephanie, you're next. Okay, um, it, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. So I will report on our star, and this is based on a joint paper with Martin Uribe on the macroeconomic consequences of natural rate shocks. Um, so the, the definition of our star that I will use in my remarks is as the permanent component of the real short-term interest rate. That is the definition that was first offered in the seminal work of Laubach and Williams. And um, my empirical work is not the same as theirs, but similar. So why should a central bank care about our star? What's, what's the meaning for them? And <clears throat> we will, our star, defined in that way, is relevant because it refers to the real interest rate that obtains in the absence of any cyclical shocks. And in that state of the world, you would say that the normal interest rate that the central bank sets should be equal to the sum of R star and the inflation target. So suppose the inflation target is 2% and we came to determine that R star is 1%, then it would say that the interest rate that the central bank should set is 3%, or in the jargon of the profession would be that the neutral nominal short-term rate would be 3%. So that's the importance of our star. There is a large literature on estimating our, the path of our star. Um, we also do this. Um, we look, as many other people here in the audience have also done on long data, why might you be tempted to think it is interesting to go back in time and look at data, in our case, since 1900, is because for a long time we thought the world is the great moderation. There are very small fluctuations in inflation output only, but this idea that we live in the great moderation has I don't want to say disappeared, but you might reconsider that idea because of the big fluctuations we, see, we have seen in the 2008 financial crisis and then in COVID. So that's the motivation why we look at long data. And what this graph shows you with a solid line is the point estimate of R star since 1900. And I want you to remember maybe, well, I'm gonna make four comments on it, but maybe I want you to remember only one point, the one I'm gonna stress the most. This is not a horizontal line from 1900 until 1985 and then declining, but this is a what we call a super cycle. There have been some swings. So maybe the previous super cycle began before our sample, before 1900, and then our star has, with lots of uncertainty, I admit that, been drifting down, and the trough of that cycle occurred at an important point in economic history, namely in 1933 at the end of the global financial crisis. And then, generously, I look through some of the bumps, and I would say, in that trough in 1933, a new cycle began that reached a peak in the early 1980s or mid-1980s, and from this point, we started again a decline in our star. And so that's the, the first thing I want you to keep in mind. There's a super cycle, the declines in our star that we have seen since the mid-1980s 
are not new. In the history, we have seen that before, so we are not in completely uncharted territory. The second point I would like you to see in this graph, and that is something that has also been emphasized by papers of the speaker that will follow me, is that of the two percentage point decrease in our star since the 1980s until now, about one percentage point occurred during the financial crisis of 2008. So big declines of our star in a financial crisis. My sample has two financial crises, 2008, and also um, 1933, 1929 to 1933. I don't want to take this literally, that it fell so much, but I see that at least in the two financial crises in my sample, there was a big decline in our star. That gives me some pointers of where I think theory will help me to understand what moves our star. And so I'm gonna latch on to this observation that it fell a lot in the two financial crises. And then um, just a quick answer to um, a talk of Isabel is our star rising at least in this way of estimating our star, which might not be the definition you have in mind. Um, there is maybe a pause, maybe we are trapped right now and we're gonna start a new upward slope, but we can't say. We haven't seen it rising yet, it seems to be flat. So from this super cycle pattern, um, one might say, okay, we always hear that demographic considerations could be a potentially compelling explanation of movements in our star. And those demographic considerations that are mentioned are typically linked to ideas such as a decline in the population growth rate or in aging of the population. That means how many economically active people you have relative to the retired people. So if you look at data, at least in the United States, there's a monotonically increasing share of economically inactive people or um, population aging has increased monotonically since 1900. So if you want to say that these super cycles that this graph suggests is driven by demographic consideration, that's at least inconsistent. So that, that makes you think not of demographic reasons. Um, so the second, one of the things we do in our empirical work is to ask what are the drivers of our star. So we have an econometric model in which we can ask what happens if there's a shock that lowers our star by one percentage point, what happens to endogenous variables? So I brought you one of those pictures, um, namely what happens to real GDP per capita. And what this figure tells you if there's a shock that lowers our star by one percentage point, then it lowers the level of real GDP per capita in the long run about seven percentage point. So I didn't dare to bring three figures, but to think about what this impulse response means, if you see these plots of the level of real GDP per capita, it's a parallel downward shift. So I'm not talking about a change in the growth rate here, I'm getting a downward parallel shift in, in um, the level of real GDP per capita. Why is it interesting to show you that picture? Because I will have to come up, or it helps me to talk about what are theories that might be able to be consistent with a decline in the real rate of interest and a negative level effect on output. And that is why I put initially my finger on that in my sample I have two financial crises. In both of these financial crises, our star fell, and I'm gonna claim that this can be made consistent with this observation um, that there was a downward parallel shift in the level of output. And it's gonna go very much in, in the direction perhaps what um, Federica gave, because the idea is, um, Suppose you have liquidity frictions in the economy. We all know that the strength of liquidity frictions determines the value of a short-term asset might be the interest rate it pays you. That is what my R star would measure. But it also has a shadow value, namely how useful that particular asset is, say, in posting collateral, how much collateral you can get to that. And that is not 
incorporated in the interest rate. That's a shadow value. So the higher is the shadow value of the asset, the lower is R star. But that means when R star is low, it also means the financial constraint should be more binding or should be tighter. And these are moments, if this is a financial constraint on investment of the economy, for example, it all also will mean that the level of investment, not the balance growth part, but the level of investment will be lower. So it will lead to this joint observation um, that you have that a negative shock to our star, which would mean a financial tightening, is, a show, is associated with a negative effect on, on the level of output. And that is what this impulse response um, suggests. Since I have 60, no, I'll leave it here. But that's what I wanted to say. Very, very good, Stephanie, thank you. So uh, the, the final speaker in the first round is John. It's great to be here um, in this panel on this uh, topic that obviously I've uh, th uh, spent a lot of time in my career uh, thinking about. So for over 125 years, uh, and I can back this up with data, uh, for over 125 years, economists have grappled with a dilemma. So how can a concept that's just at the very heart of monetary theory be so vexing to quantify? Now, so of course, I'm talking about R star, the natural rate of interest. And these quotations I have in table one reflect the age-old challenges surrounding um, the measurement of R star and the importance of R star. And, I, and if you go back to Vixel, Cassell, my namesake, John H. Williams, who has, I think, the best quote in our star of all time. Uh, and then, importantly, Milton Friedman's uh, presidential address talks about the new natural rate of interest as well. Um, and then, you know, uh, when Thomas Laubach and I uh, wrote about this uh, a little over 20 years ago, uh, we, we emphasized, again, the time variation in the natural rate of interest, as well as the uh, significant uncertainty about that. And of course, today we're seeing the same discussions uh, happening once again. So my, my comments will very clearly focus on longer run R star, which is the real rate expected to prevail when shocks to the economy have receded and the economy is growing at its potential rate. Before I go any further, I have to give the standard Fed disclaimer that everything I say reflects my own views and not necessarily those of the Federal Open Market Committee or anyone else in the Federal Reserve System. Well, Milton Friedman, in his essay, said that we didn't really have ways to estimate natural rates uh, back in 1968. But since uh, he made that claim, there are now uh, a number of common approaches to inferring R star from the data. One is to use statistical methods to extract a longer run trend. Uh, the second is to base it on financial market or survey data. Uh, and the third is to look at R star's effects on economic data. And I think each one of these is useful, provides uh, valuable information to researchers and others, but they each also pose significant uh, challenges, uh, which has already been discussed. So uh, back in one of my papers with Thomas Laubach, we did look at some of these other methods and we emphasized or, or argued that univariate statistical methods uh, do not adequately control for economic effects of, uh, factors influence interest rates. And therefore, these estimates can be overly influenced by large macroeconomic disturbances. Think back of uh, the inflation of the 70s or the pandemic. Financial market and survey data are subject to mismeasurement issues, and in any case, tell us what people are talking about, R star, or how they're thinking about it, rather than acting as an independent source of information on R star. It's what I called uh, uh, several years ago uh, the Hall of Mirrors effect. So for these reasons, I'm gonna focus on estimates of R star that, com that come from macro models that do not rely on financial market or survey data. And of course, you know, in picking from the wide range of models we chose, uh, I chose the Halston Laubach Williams model. Uh, and that infers the natural rate of interest through the behavior of interest rates, inflation, and GDP, or as the economist John H. Williams put it, by its works. Our estimates of our, our star in the Euro area in the United States, states uh, fell dramatically over the quarter century uh, leading up to the pandemic, and they're currently near the estimates that we obtained uh, directly prior to the pandemic. So figure one here shows the time series of our R star estimates for the Euro area uh, in gold and, uh, and in the United States. So I'm gonna focus here on the Euro area, um, given our location. <clears throat> 
the estimate of our, our the estimate of our star in the euro area was 0.5% uh, in 2023. That's equal to its average of the five years prior to the outbreak of COVID. And, in, in, and this estimate is, or this assessment is a, of a very low R star is broadly consistent with the analysis done by ECB economists using a variety of methods. The sizable decline in estimates of R star during the decades prior to the pandemic is common to many advanced and emerging uh, economies. It reflects developments related to the global supply and demand for savings. And it sounds like that's the one thing we all agree about. Uh, but, you know, the literature has highlighted uh, falling birth rates and relatively low productivity growth have reduced the demand for savings over time. And of course, increases in longevity and wealth inequality have been identified as potential reasons for an increase in supply of savings. I would emphasize the word global. Because in a world of open capital markets, one would expect that R star to be highly correlated, if not, in fact, the same across countries. In fact, in our paper with uh, Catherine Holson and Thomas Laubach, uh, Laubach in 2017, we, we showed that there is, quite a, there is evidence that R star estimates are, across countries are highly interconnected, although local factors do also play a role. Now, the role of common and idiosyncratic factors is seen by comparing estimates for the euro area to those in the United States, as you see in the figure. Although the two sets of estimates display some shorter-term wiggles, the dominant shared feature is a substantial, sustained two percentage point decline in R star over the past 30 years. We see the same pattern in our model estimates for Canada. According to these estimates, the low R star regime endures. This finding runs counter to recent commentary suggesting that R star has risen due to persistent changes in the, balance, uh, in the balance between the supply and demand for savings, such as higher investment in AI and renewable energy, as well as larger uh, government debt. In fact, some measures of longer run R star have in fact risen to levels well above those that we saw directly prior to the pandemic. In particular, or for example, market-based measures of five-year, five-year forward real rates for the euro area in the United States have risen well above uh, the HLW estimates, as shown in this figure. So up in the upper panel is the euro estimates. The blue lines are the HLW model estimates. The gold lines are taken from uh, real, uh, far forward real rates in the lower panels for the US. So two things stand out from this figure, and there's a lot of estimates of R star. Matter of fact, most estimates of R star use data either from financial markets or surveys. So, um, uh, so I, when you look at what's going on in financial markets, it helps you think about some of these estimates of R star. So two things stand out. First, until recently, the far forward real rates uh, displayed a broadly similar pattern of decline as we saw in the model estimates of R star. So there's a lot of, before the pandemic, all, these things tended to move uh, together and tell the same story. Hence, I think, a pretty broad consensus that natural rates had, had declined significantly in the decades pr prior to the pandemic. Um, but uh, the second uh, point I would make is that market-based measures can be quite volatile. Indeed, in the years before the recent rise, they had fallen to very low levels, quite negative, in both the US and the Euro area, and at well below uh, the corresponding model estimates. In looking at this more closely, uh, there's evidence of significant time-varying risk premium in, in, uh, in bond yields, and that interferes with taking the market-based measures at face value and assessing what markets are telling us about perceptions of R star. For example, if we, uh, based on D'Amico, Kim, and Wei term structure model for the U.S., the estimated uh, rise in the U.S. far forward expected real yields since the onset of the pandemic is significantly smaller than that implied by the direct real read of uh, uh, real yields um, from, from TIPS markets. So where does that leave us regarding R star? Although the value of R star is highly uncertain, which was emphasized from 125 years ago, emphasized in my paper with Thomas Laubach in 2003, I, I would argue that the case for a sizable increase in R star has yet to meet, uh, meet two important tests. First, owing to the interconnectedness of R star across countries, plausible factors pushing up R star on a sustained basis are likely to be global in nature. This highlights a tension between the evidence from Europe that R star is still low and arguments in the United States that R star is now closer to level seen around 20 years ago. Uh, 
Second, any increase in R star must overcome the forces that have been pushing it down for decades. In this regard, recent data reinforce the continuation of pre-pandemic trends in global demographics and productivity growth, along with some of, uh, some of the other drivers of R star. One's lens through which to see this is our model's estimates of potential GDP, or what we very creatively called Y star. Uh, Potential, potent, potential growth rate of uh, Y star is a key factor in our model that affects R star in many theories. So many of the explanations arguing for a higher R star today would likely show up in higher potential output growth as well. However, the HLW estimates of uh, Euro area and US trend potential GDP, or the trend growth in Y star, today in 2023 are nearly unchanged from their respective 2019 values. And this is consistent with other estimates of potential GDP growth for the Euro area in the United States. So we're not seeing evidence of a significant shift in the trend growth rates of the economies or in our estimates of R-star. So let me end uh, with a brief comment on the usefulness of estimates of R-star for policymaking. First, as uh, Swedish economists uh, Newt Vixell and others have stressed, R-star is either explicitly or implicitly at the core of any macroeconomic model or monetary framework that one can imagine. Pretending it doesn't exist or wishing it away doesn't change that fact. In that context, it is important that we do our best to understand the factors that affect our star and the uncertainties related to it so that we have the best possible understanding of the forces affecting the long-term evolution of our economies. And second, and equally importantly, as shown in my work with Athanasios Orphanides, the high degree of uncertainty about R star means that one should not overly rely on estimates of R star in determining the appropriate setting of monetary policy at a given point in time. Instead, such determinations must be and are based on a wide range of information and assessments, including those related to risk. Thank you. So uh, I think um, uh, th there's commonalities across the four presentations, uh, but of course there's also different areas of, of emphasis. But before um, uh, turning it back to, to, to the panelists, uh, we've also essentially heard a lot about Orsar across many of the sessions across the last two days. And indeed in the title of the, of the event in terms of uh, an era of transformation, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just, I'm going to ask each panelist to see if they have any responses to what they've heard, uh, but maybe I'll have an overlay question, which is essentially, in a world of uncertainty, um, uh, there, there are different ways uncertainty can affect or star, uh, but let me interconnect with monetary policy. So how monetary policy is conducted under uncertainty? Um, do you have a sense in either direction? In other words, if monetary policy uh, supports economic recovery, does that raise or lower or star in the future? Or equally, if monetary policy is insufficiently supportive, uh, do you get into a trap where the economy fails to recover and or star might be lower for that reason, which I think part of your previous work with John Luca and others or, or people had that flavor. But anyway, uh, we'll we go in order. So. If you want to pick up anything of what you've heard, Claudio, uh, over the two days or over the panel? Uh, so let me actually start from the last uh, remark that John made, with which I, I fully agree. And, and it's the fact that in a context in which our star is so hard to pin down, um, you would like to, to have a monetary policy strategy which uh, reduces the weight that it assigns to it. Um, so in, uh, to me, you will find out wh where R star is if you want to use it at, at the core of your framework uh, when you get there. And how do you know when you get there? Well, basically, you will be in a situation in which, roughly speaking, is inflation is doing fine. But I would also add to that, not only that inflation is fine, you've got low unemployment and the like, but I would also add for what I said earlier about a more complete definition of equilibrium over time, that you're also in a situation in which those symptoms are there, but also you don't have the sense that there is a buildup in, of some kind of imbalance in the economy, including financial imbalances. So I think that a more 
a richer definition of an equilibrium in real interest rate would include not just inflation, not just potential output, but would include what's happening on the financial side, because that can have big implications for potential output, for actual output, and for inflation down the road, as we, as we saw, for example, in Stephanie's, uh, Stephanie's own work and even uh, John's work. When you have a financial crisis, that actually does tend to reduce the equilibrium real interest rate in some sense in the economy. Um, so uh, that, that's basically my, my, main, my main point. For example, now you, we have a situation in which, um, as we mentioned, uh, we heard yesterday, there's still possible upside risks to inflation. Those that I would stress are those that are uh, uh, related to the fact that we've got these two relative prices that haven't quite adjusted, services versus goods, core goods and real wages. And of course, the two are very closely linked because services are very labor intensive. Um, and you also have a situation in which ideally you would not like to, to go back to the previous world in which uh, you basically run out of monetary policy room for maneuver at a time when fiscal policy has effectively run out of room for maneuver. If you have another recession down the road, it's gonna be very difficult for fiscal policy to act given that fiscal positions are already on unsustainable trajectories. And you would definitely like to have some room for maneuvering monetary policy to react. So I think based on this, my, my suggestion is, well, let's, uh, let's try and go slow with these, and at least not rush to, uh, to ease on the assumption that real interest rates, equilibrium real interest rates, have to be as low as they were, uh, or we thought they were, before, uh, before the inflation share, um, surge. Thank you, uh, Frederica. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for the question. So I think uh, there are different things to think, right? I think uh, Ricardo is in, Ricardo Resch is in the audience that speak about R star or M star, right? And there are two different variables. So there is the marginal uh, product of capital that I think behave very differently with respect to R star. So it's also different. I think like the, the, the central bank can affect this to measure maybe in a different way. So we see R star that is collapsing, but we see the marginal product of capital is actually flat over time. So it's very difficult to understand. If you want to simulate the corporate sector, then maybe we should affect M star and not R star, or vice versa. I, I agree with uh, Claudio that, uh, I mean, in part, like if I think about our framework, uh, is the fiscal policy can do something, but now the space for the fiscal policy is very much, uh, uh, so the, the fiscal policy has a, doesn't have a lot of space. However, I mean, I do believe in part that there, there are these, I do believe that there are these multiple city state, and what happens is that, in some sense, if the monetary policy does the right thing, it can also have a very fast recovery because if you are switching the equilibrium and you're going to like a much higher star maybe, then there's, there will not be the need anymore to have this uh, zero lower bound on all these constraint problems. And I think in part, the fact that we were thinking that star was low and we were playing all these unconventional policy in order to stimulate the economy could be part of the problem for the reason why RSR was actually so, so low. So in some sense, I think I'm very positive. I think the central bank can do a lot of things here. Okay, very good. Stephanie? Yeah, so um, can monetary policy affect RSR? Again, that depends a little bit on the definition. I would say that in the most commonly used conceptual framework of monetary policy making, it is assumed that the key friction is a rigidity in nominal prices or nominal wages, and then the idea is to bring about an equilibrium via monetary policies so that the economy looks as if we had undone this friction, so as if prices are flexible and wages are flexible. And that is, for a policymaker, of course, the most relevant measure maybe of the short-term equilibrium interest rate, and that might be quite different from what I have been calling our star, and so I think there, on this gap, the monetary policy maker has a lot of power because they can close that, that, that interest rate gap in the short run. Now, thinking about the really long run, is it true that monetary policy can influence what the real short-term interest rate is? Absent any cyclical variations, I have more reservations. I think simple plots in introductory economic textbooks about the relationship between the nominal interest rate and inflation sort of support that there is a long run Fisher effect. I'm not talking about neo-Fisherianism, just a long run Fisher effect, which means 
that it is very difficult to find empirical support for the assumption that monetary policy affects real rates in the long run. In fact, we started out in this paper trying to see if we could find something along these ways, and doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but we tried it a little bit and we came up empty-handed. So I would say in the really long run, I think I have not seen evidence that overturns the long-run Fisher effect. Thank you. John? Well, I agree with uh, what Stephanie was saying. I think, you know, on this multiple e steady states, multiple equilibrium models, which, you know, there have been different versions of these for decades now, uh, and, and uh, you know, there, I think it's really, at least from my perspective, it's really important to, to say that these are, these are multiple equilibria in terms of real allocations. Uh, so the levels of output and things like that. And so, you know, I feel like they're getting kind of pulled into this you know, multiple R star because R star is kind of an interesting thing to talk about in that way. But they are models that tell you there's multiple steady states, which are interesting. I think getting back to the evidence uh, about this and the transition, I think, uh, deserves a lot more study. And, you know, when, when Stephanie and Martine and, and Jess did their work with multiple uh, equilibria with a zero low bound, the perils of the Taylor rule, I mean, a lot of people studied this very carefully, including my work with Thomas Mertens, because it's a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a profound insight into the fact that you're going to have multiple equilibria. Uh, in, but they, you know, at least in our paper, when we studied the implications of that theory, which is completely, you know, we showed exactly the same thing you all showed, theoretically, we found the empirical implications of that kind of um, liquidity trap equilibrium were not supported by the data. So I think, you know, I, I'm very interested in, in kind of models that have multiple equilibria, making sure we understand that. Uh, but I just think we should need, de definitely, as you did, Stephanie, like look for the evidence carefully uh, uh, about the relationship between actually short-term monetary policy and kind of a long-run concept uh, like R star. There's just one sentence on this. As a policymaker, I think the most important thing we do in terms of affecting the long-run variables of the, of the economy, one is that we eliminate the uncertainty about what inflation will be in the long run, so pi star, if you will. Uh, and we've done that in central banking around the world throughout uh, over the past few decades, and especially during the pandemic, that we take that uncertainty out. And to the best that we are able to stabilize inflation and stabilize the economy, that reduces macro uncertainty. You can't get rid of all of it because there's a uh, irreducible uncertainty in any economy. But to the extent that we can reduce uncertainty and we can re, uh, and have people have confidence about the inflation target, I think you know that may affect actually uh, real outcomes in the long run. Very good. Um, so I think we we have, we have time for. Uh uh, questions and comments from the floor, um, and uh, I'm, I'm a very left-handed person. I'm aware the left side of the room ha has not been overrepresented so far, so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go in, in, in sections. But I will favour the left hand, my left hand, uh, and uh, Alan Blinder. This is a uh, Hamlet and the Prince of Denmark question. Uh, John and others raised quite correctly. Um, things that you might expect to affect the balance of saving and investment and therefore the natural rate. Why does not anybody look at data on savings and investment? That's what we did. Very, very good. Uh, so again, from, from the left panel, because I'm not coming back to you. So the left, left side of the room, uh, is there anyone else? Okay, I, I'll move to the, to the center. Uh, Isabel uh, and then uh, Klaus, please. So please. In the front row here. Uh, thank you very much. So absolutely fascinating panel. Uh, I have more uh, of a comment, um, mostly mostly on uh, on what John uh, said. Uh, so I mean, there is of course not necessarily a contradiction between the fact that some of the factors that have been pushing down our star are still present, and that still our star may uh, may uh, move up. And I mean, we've seen this historically that uh, kind of at times of, uh, of transformations, I mean, we've seen these deviations from the long run downward uh, trend. And so the question uh, is, and I think it's an open question because uh, I mean, you don't see it in, in uh, some of your uh, estimates, but the, the question is, are we not again in such a, uh, well, an era of transformation <laughs> Uh, where uh, actually several things are happening that could lead uh, to one of those uh, deviations uh, from this uh, kind of more down downward trend. And of course, I mean, the green transformation uh, comes uh, to mind. Uh, I mean, the AI uh, revolution. And I mean, uh, uh, all of those transformations, uh, let us expect that there, that there should be, I mean, globally, 
an investment boom, which is almost unavoidable. If, if you think about climate change, I mean, it's not ju just about the climate transition. It's also about, I mean, adaptation. Or if we don't do anything, I mean, it's, uh, it's about just repair. So uh, would that mean that we, uh, we could expect that uh, our star uh, should uh, move up, even maybe uh, at some point it may uh, go back to that negative trend? Thank you. Uh, and next, uh, Klaus in, in the back row. Thank you for taking the question. So looking at the historical estimates of our star, um, there are two things that stick out. One is the downward trend since the 70s. But there is also this um, episode around the great financial crisis 2007-8 where suddenly uh, the estimates tank and they don't recover and they don't recover even though the real economy has recovered. So now there are alternative interpretations one can give to that. One is along the lines of Federica that says we have entered a new regime and we are in a new steady state and maybe there's some multiplicity in the steady state value. There's an alternative interpretation is that something happened prior to that that sort of masked the decline and then suddenly it materialized during the crisis. So I would like to uh, hear the committee's view on which of these is more plausible, maybe. Okay, thank you, Claire. And I'll just take Bayas uh, and then turn back to the panel. So in the second row here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I certainly feel that uh, the concept of our star has had quite a career over the last uh, career jump over the last mm. year or so, maybe as a, as, as a result of um, inflation being a bit stickier and, 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 and growth being more resilient. Um, but then, um, so, so my question would be, you know, whether when we talk here about our star, would you just say, well, you know, there's short term, there's long term, long term our star, and really what is happening right now doesn't doesn't affect your overall uh, uh, sense, uh, or have you, you know, over the last year or so, maybe changed uh, uh, the way you look uh, at this concept? Has it influenced uh, how you would assess it currently? Thank you. Okay, so I'll ask each of the panelists to take up whatever they they want to pick up from those questions. So, Claudio. Um, well, on the, on, the, on the financial crisis, um, uh, again, that depends very much on, uh, also on the type of model that you have in your mind. I, ca I can sort of write models in which effectively our star is not, partic is not even unique in terms of multiple equilibrium, but more to the point that depending on the uh, in real interest rate that you have, you're going to have economic fluctuations that are quite different. It's quite clear that once you have a financial crisis, interest rates will have to fall in order to help balance sheet repair, in order to help the economy to recover. And then the question is, what led to the financial crisis? Uh, what are the factors that led to the crisis to start with? And whether those factors can somehow be related to our star. Again, I think that it's, these discussions uh, are very unlikely to, to find a sort of a clear answer that is going to be particularly helpful at the end of the day for, for policy. But let me stop there. I mean, I could take the other well, one. Well, I, I think Alan Blinder. Alan Blinder. Quest about saving, because you've worked on this. About yes, this. I mean, it, the, well, obviously, you, use, you, you might be able to use saving and investment. In equilibrium, saving and investment must be the same. So you, you have either you use exogenous variables that are supposed to be linked to saving and investment uh, in order to see what's happening to and uh, correlate those with real interest rates. Or you might do it across countries, but even across countries, we know that for the world as a whole, saving and investment exposed must be, must be the same. Um, now, what I think is very important uh, is that whenever, whenever one tries to link the presumed determinants of, re uh, of equilibrium real interest rates and, uh, and and the real interest rates over long periods and various measures of those, it's very difficult to find a stable re relationship over time. And I think that's, that's key when one is thinking, because that is the basis for which pe uh, that people use in order to say our star has gone up or has gone down. But actually, empirically, the relationship is very, very loose. Thank okay. you, Federica. I will start from Klaus and then I will move. So let me double down to what you say. After 2008, I think there are other things that happened in the market that were very strange. So if you look at, there is a paper by Perry and some co-author that say the equity market boom like crazy and then it starts to increase. 
Then there is XMP, but there should monopsony actually is increasing also. And in the meantime, I think Caballero, uh, Gurinchas, and Farid they show that marginal product of capital stay constant and our stars start to decline. So in some sense, uh, and it's a very strange uh, trend because if you look at the data after 2007, like, so all these variables start to like, uh, change in a very strange way. So this is the reason why I was thinking to multiple regime, right? That we're like moving from one to the other. There could be different explanations, but so far it's like, I think it's difficult to say that, oh, we were like in the same regime like we were before 2008, 2007. Now, to go back to Isabel said, I think like exactly, so if we move so fast, so if there was like, I mean, if you look all the data and the trend, like after 2007, like our star was declining and in different series, I mean, I look at, I'm not a data person, but I look at the series, it seems that there is a big uh, change, right? So it also could be that in the future, we're going to have a big spike. I don't see why this shouldn't be the case. And it's true that we can have something like that is moving in the opposite direction. Maybe I'm wrong about the multiple city state. I don't think I'm wrong, but it's like, I, I think like uh, we, we should understand what happened exactly during that year and what the change in the market. And if we keep like thinking that everything was exactly equal before 2007, we're making a sort of mistake. And going back to, uh, I think, like uh, investment and saving, I think one can use investment and saving, but then if you look at the investment, I think like then the return is the marginal product of capital. And going back to the point, I think marginal product of capital is like, if they don't use this, in, if, if in the estimation they don't put uh, the return on, on, uh, on bonds, then the marginal product of capital has been flat. And it seems that there is a huge, uh, so, in some sense, there it doesn't it doesn't seem to be any puzzle because it is exactly what we expect we have from the data. So did I reply to all the question? Yes. Have you changed? Uh, did I change my view about our star in the last uh, year? I mean, it's like yes, <laughs> quite a lot because I, I, I was not an expert. I'm, I mean, it's like I, I usually work much more. <laughs> I, I mean, John, I'm not an expert, but it's like I, I didn't think about uh, our star. And actually, like the, in part, the idea about our star came from. A discussion, maybe Claudio doesn't remember, but it was a, a discussion made by Claudio in uh, some, someone else, uh, Moritz Sularik and other people were discussing uh, saving glass, and I think Claudio was the one very vocal saying, oh, no, the saving glass is not there. And I started to think whether there was something different, and then this is like where, where this project started. Very good. S Stephanie? Okay, so um, I can say something to two questions. Let's start with Alan. Um, of course, the famous paper by Ben Bernanke on the global savings cloud said once, let's make it simple, East Asia started running very large current account deficits, current account surpluses. Beginning in the late 90s, we saw a big shift in the savings and we saw a big increase in the supply of savings and therefore the real interest rate fell. So that's the most important story, I guess, it's Ben Bernanke's global saving glut hypothesis. This is probably a good story, um, but we do see in, you know, beginning from the work stressed by Williams and Laubach that measures of our star have been declining since the early 1980s, whereas that effect, for example, where tr somebody tried to use evidence on that would date it um, 10, 15 years later. Then um, with respect to Isabel's question, Suppose we, we take it as given that we are at a moment where the future might not look that similar than the past. Maybe there's more uncertainty, there's more chance of war, there's um, a green transformation that needs tons of investment. There is the AI revolution, which might need a lot of investment. So maybe one thinks about a period, um, maybe people forgot that word, but um, maybe some people remember Y2K. So there was this idea that once we, the year 2000 comes, maybe some computer systems will not work. And there was a whole literature on tons of investment to prepare for Y2K. In that particular period, maybe other shocks were also occurring, but it was not a period in which ASTA rose, which is your, intui your intuition is right. If we have a big shift in the investment demand, we should see that we move up a given savings curve and our star goes up. But if I think about also big investments that came with the IT revolution, these were all periods in which, at least in the data, unconditionally on net, the equilibrium interest rate fell. Very good, John. 
Um, I, many of the things I wanted to say have been said, so I won't do that. And, but going to Isabel, yeah, uh, a couple things. Uh, similar to what Stephanie said, but maybe I'll take a slightly different uh, angle on that. If you look at our, okay, first of all, origin story of Laubach Williams, we were writing it at a time when productivity growth was really high and uh, trend GDP growth is very high. And the question we were actually asking is, is the, is the neutral rate higher than usual? Now, the fact that you know, all the talk about our star since then is about how it's fallen, but w the question we were asking was exactly as about the question you're asking me today. It was, and so when you look at our original, you look at our, our, our estimates of our star, which you know, we have all the real-time estimates posted, and, and uh, you know, we did find higher potential growth in the U.S. during the, uh, say, you know, the, that period of 95 to 2005. We found our R star estimates were elevated. You can see it in the picture and the things I showed. But as Stephanie said, elevated relative to a downward trend. So two things I would just say on this, and this is obviously purely, uh, you know, advertising for our model, is it did catch these things in real time. Uh, it isn't the case that Laubach Williams or HLW afterwards, you have to wait 15 years to figure out whether, whether there was a trend GDP growth um, uh, shift happening or higher productivity. You saw it in that model. You saw it in regime shifting models too. So I think you know, the data will actually speak on major transformative changes of the kind that you talk about. Second is, of course, you're identifying the issues that we should be thinking about in terms of our start big shifts in demand or, or savings. Um, I just, you know, I'll just mention, you know, they aren't in the data yet. Maybe they'll be in the data in the future uh, in terms of model estimates. And I guess the one thing maybe we, we, we might disagree on and I think needs further thought is I, I think we have to be cautious in adding things together. And so I'll use my AI thing that I say a lot is, you know, there are two versions of what's going to happen with AI. I do not know the answer. No one here knows the answer. One version is 10 years from now, uh, we'll be talking about, wow, this was the decade of really rapid 2, 3, 4% productivity growth and you know, amazing innovation and investment. And this is the world where my estimates of R star and I think actual R star will have risen a lot. That's one version. I think that's the one that you're highlighting. Uh, the other version is 10, 15 years from now, we're going to be looking back at this decade and say, wow, we had 1.5% productivity growth, which is the long run average in the US. And that AI thing you know, was really important to get us the average. And that's the Bob Gordon view, right? You go back 100 and some years, the US productivity growth has been roughly constant, had some periods of higher and slower. But what we've done historically is like, wow, we had, you know, uh, we had industrialization. We moved people off uh, the farms. We had automation. We had computer Computers, we had the internet. We come up with the names that are associated with the actual miracle of free enterprise capitalism, which is delivering consistently over a century of more than 1% productivity growth. That is the, the thing that is the, kind of the, the, the miraculous thing about things. Only afterwards do we really know, was it transformative and boosted growth to 2 to 3%, or is it the thing that just got us the growth? Either way, it's a good story because it gets you the, uh, a continuing improvement in standard of living. Very quickly, I know I'm going a little long here. Short run uh, versus long run, I think this is a very important issue. I focus on long run. I find and have always found short run R star uh, kind of complicated because it really reflects all the factors that are affecting the economy in the short run. Of course, as a student of Mike Woodford, there is a notion, as you mentioned, of a very short run R star, but that's not what, uh, you know, that's not how I think about the economy. I think about it as a long run. Klaus uh, Onum's uh, question is a great question. It's one that I've thought about for a long time and don't have an answer for. My intuition, but could be wrong, is that our R star estimates were um, artificially boosted before the uh, because of the housing first the stock market stock market bubble dot com boom then the housing bubble in the U S were factors that were causing the real economy to outperform kind of fundamentals for quite a number of years that made R star look higher when the financial crisis hit you know it, the estimates fell they fell like a rock by the way they didn't we didn't have to wait five years they fell really rapidly so I think there is an issue about what were the drivers and the timing? I think it was probably something that was already underway, but was um, kind of hidden because we had these other factors. And that's my last point, going to Ken Rogoff and his co-authors on the hundreds of years of R star, and you can't pin, you can't pin uh, R star, the two, you know, R star's changes over hundreds of years to any specific factors. And I think his, when I read his paper, I think that he actually identifies why you can't, and that is there's a lot going on over a couple hundred years, and he identifies financial uh, liberalization, improvement, improvements in efficiency, 
in a, of our financial systems, of course, lower R star or change that. Other things move the other way. I find these bivariate attempts to say, oh, it, it doesn't explain by this variable, so therefore we don't know what it is, is very misleading. I think it's because it's affected by thousands of things and it's hard to get all of those in a model. I, I think that's why it's hard uh, in you know, any given uh, work to say we, you know, it's, it's productivity growth, it's demographics, because I think it's a lot of things that are affecting it. Very good, so uh, now uh, I'm gonna to go to the right of the room and uh, I'm gonna take uh, Richard, uh, Kristen, Krishna, and Jordi. So that's the four, okay. So front row, please. Thank you. Richard Portis, London Business School. Um, uh, some of us remember back only 10 years uh, when R star became a fashionable topic in the context of secular stagnation discussions. And that word, that phrase, hasn't appeared at all in, um, in the discussion this morning. And I'm curious as to why not. Um, but let me, turn to, um, let me turn to my preoccupation, which is financial stability. And there, I think, uh, well, it was mentioned, I think Claudia actually mentioned it, uh, but not very much. And I think we should be looking very closely at the consequences of low R star, however we define it, however we measure it, whatever it is underlying, low real interest rates for extended periods of time, the consequences of that for financial stability. And we've, we've seen them, actually, because we had a period of very low real interest rates. We had the search for yield. We had the vulnerabilities that built up during that period. Uh, and um, the consequences of those vulnerabilities when nominal interest rates went way up. Uh, and we still, we haven't ended, I think. I mean, that, that chapter is not yet closed. So I'd be interested to know the views of the panel about the financial stability consequences of their views of R star. Because it's probably for proximity. Uh, uh, Jordy's right behind you. If you can pass the. Jordy and I are always together. You know. <laughs> yeah, this one's for Claudio. Uh, so if, um, of course, R star is not a universal constant. It may change over time, as a result of. Uh, changes in the underlying uh, driving forces. But if we end up reaching the conclusion, as you seem to have uh, reached, that at any point in time, there is no well-defined R star, and hence that central banks can actually influence the real interest rate permanently, I think we have to revisit the case for central bank independence, because uh, it tells you that the central banks have much more power on, say, income, in, on having a permanent effect on income and wealth inequality that, uh, that we admit now conventionally. So, uh, Kristen in the corner, and then uh, Krishna. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Isabel mentioned several potential transformations that could affect our start. One you didn't mention was QT. Uh, Frederica showed us in a nice simple model how QE reduces our start. We've now had a pretty sudden shift where a number of major central banks have shifted from QE to QT. A number of the big banks have reduced their purchases uh, during the pandemic by a quarter to a half. When you add that up globally, that's a pretty big shift. So do any of you think that could have, have affected or be affecting our start? Very good, uh, Krishna. So happily, my question is very closely linked to Kristen's. Um, you know, given the importance of long rates in the economy, uh, presumably we should be thinking about equilibrium yield curves and, and equilibrium 10-year rates, not simply overnight rates, in which case the, sh the overnight R starred and if you like, the TP starred, the new equilibrium term premium would be jointly determined. And it seems plausible that in the new normal post-pandemic, the bigger difference might lie in the equilibrium term premium rather than the equilibrium overnight rate, given the high level of government debt issuance, the transition from QE to QT, but also shifting stock bond uh, correlations that affect the equilibrium risk premium on, gov on government debt. So I'd be interested in the thoughts the panels have on, panels have on that topic, and indeed any implications for the joint setting of balance sheets and overnight rates. 
Okay, very good. So um, again, it's probably efficient to go to go in order. So Claudio. Okay, financial stability, uh, uh, Richard. I think that's critical. And if it didn't come across sufficiently clearly in my presentation, that I wasn't uh, very good. I mean, the um, think about the following way. You can think of what happened before the great financial crisis. Uh, and if you, it was partly related to what you said, uh, John, in two different ways. You can, you can do the summers. The summers narrative is basically that there were factors that were driving equilibrium real interest rates low. Our star defined as output at potential inflation, uh, stable, blah, blah, blah. They were driving interest rates low. But that was creating bubbles. And that, therefore, was creating financial problems down the road. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the summer's narrative. So he sticks to the definition of R star as output at potential over time at a particular point in time and so on. Another way of thinking about it, which is the way that I prefer to think about it, is that a rate that basically causes, in the narrative, a major financial crisis a few years down the road is not an equilibrium real rate. And that's why when I, when I talked about, do I think that definitions of our proper, if you have a full model, a proper model, it would also, a, a good definition of an equilibrium real interest rate would also include what's happening to the financial side. And the definitions that we have now are, are too partial from that, from that perspective. So that's point number one. Point number two, I think that the main reason for having independent central banks and independent institutions is to, to be within the state, I would like autonomous within the state, is their ability to take unpalatable decisions in the short run in order to get better outcomes in the longer run. And whether that means that there is a very precise function or a correspondence between a real interest rates and equilibrium outcomes, I don't think that, that that's affected by, by that specific issue that you raised. But we can have a, a broad discussion. On QT, it's very simple. Anything that affects uh, the risk premium, because R star is defined as the riskless rate, mm -hmm. anything that affects the risk premium will affect R star. So clearly, there is an interdependence between QT and R star. OK. So, uh, so first of all, I, I, I speak about a bit of uh, secular stagnation, because I mean, I cited this the paper of Luca and Gianluca. It's like I didn't have enough time. But I think there's a great piece of work on uh, uh, low interest rate. I think also for financial stability, I'm going to be very fast. Uh, it's a very important problem to have this low interest rate, especially because, I mean, I think there is a recent project by Refat that is here in the audience that show that the way which, uh, so the banking sector and the bond sector, they transmit uh, the interest rate in a very different way. So in some sense, the banking sector is much more correlated with the country fixed effect, correct me if I'm wrong, and the bond sector with the firm fixed effect. So it could be that having I mean, this low interest rate for a long period, we're favoring some firms over the other, and this is something that I think people should study a little bit more. Now, I will be very fast on the QT, it depends. So it's like, uh, I think it's a very good question. In some sense, it's like even with, when we take out QT, there are still like two equilibria, so it depends. But I think it could be something that can bring you back to the uh, to the rest of, other steady state. Very good. Fast. Definitely. So I'd like to uh, answer to Richard Portis. So when we found our result that a decline in the natural rate depresses the level, not the growth rate, the level of output, we thought, okay, we are just rediscovering secular stagnation. So then we just did one test and tried to estimate our model across a period where the economy was always far away from the zero lower bound. And we got the same results in qualitatively in the sense that a one percentage point decline in the natural rate depresses the level of output significantly. So that led us to conclude that maybe secular stagnation is one possibility, but it's not the only one. Because John? Um, you know, I, the relationship between secular stagnation and very, very low R star is, is clear. I mean, kind of it's, it's, it's the, kind of the other side of the coin. Um, and I, you know, I think that the, the term secular stagnation isn't being used, but if we did think that R star was very, very low, I think you know, people would be talking about it maybe more. On the term premium uh, R star question, 
you know, we should always celebrate when Claudio and I actually agree. Yes, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I do kind of see it kind of mechanically. I think, you know, we go in with QE, obviously QT is, you know, still running. In the broader, there's a big question is how much does QE and QT have a, uh, sus how big of a sustained effect does it have on the term premium? That's an open question. There's some good, great research going on by, uh, that was uh, at the poster uh, presentations uh, today. But I think that the mechanics of this are pretty clear. If you have a higher term premium, you know, persistently higher, uh, that you know, is a, uh, a reason you might think the neutral rate is lower. But I think to me, the real question is, the, the, these are all endogenous variables. Why is the term premium uh, beyond policy levers, why would the term premium be low, uh, lower or higher? Uh, and those are the factors. So I kind of think if there's some factor X out there that's driving the term premium, maybe driving other things, including R star. So I, there is a mechanical relationship that Claudio mentioned, which I completely agree with, but there's probably a deeper reason to think about this. And you know, I think one of the reasons term premium was so low was in the very low interest rate environment, not just low R star, but very low interest rate environment, very low inflation environment. Inflation risks were lower today. That's a different, uh, you know, it's a different reality that you know we, we've seen in the last few years, and that's a reason the term premium would change. But it, again, endogenously based on uh, economic uh, conditions. The last thing, if I can just say one very quick thing, it's I, I mentioned it in my presentation, but I think it's a really important point about where we are today in July of 2024 relative to where I think many of us thought we would be just three or four years ago. Now I'm gonna use my HLW model as the way to um, talk about this, but it's true, I think, of any model that people use. Today in the US, the level of potential output in our model estimates right now for Q1 are almost exactly where we were forecasting in our model in 2019 Q4. We have had the worst pandemic, the Russia's war, on Ukraine, everything that's happened. And we, and we at, at least in the US, potential output based on our measure, and of course GDP is above potential output, uh, is, uh, has not been harmed in a permanent way. And may, in fact, if anything, worse, I think potential is looking more positive for the reasons that we talked about. Similarly, in the Euro area, our estimates say that we're most of the way back in terms of potential, but a slight difference. So I think it's, it is one of the reasons I go back to maybe the world, hopefully, in terms of R star in the fundamentals, isn't quite as different as we were in that 2019 Q4. And at least from that perspective, that's actually really good news. Very good. So before I, I turn back to Claire, um, maybe I'll just make uh, one point. Uh, maybe it's not a coincidence that with the decline in R star in the last uh, number of decades, there's been a big increase in macroprudential policy. We always say the first line of defense for financial stability uh, is to have a, a lot of macroprudential policy, uh, high capital ratios and so on, to, to kind of uh, contain some of the obvious uh, risk factors from, from low interest rates. But back to Claire. Uh, 